Günaydın. Ee, Başlamadan önce bir duyuru yapayım size. Biliyorsunuz üniversitemizin bir işletme ve ekonomi topluluğu var. Bu bir öğrenci topluluğu. İşletme ve ekonomi topluluğunun yılda bir defa bir işte işletme ve ekonomi topluluğu iş seminerleri oluyor. Ee, bu topluluk arkadaşlarımız benden size bunu duyurmamı rica ettiler. Bunu hatırlatmalar ne zaman tarihleri? 12 Mart'tan 14 Mart'a kadar İstanbul'da yapacaklarmış bu işlerini. Haberli olunuz, ilgileniyorsanız gidiniz. Bunu yapacaksanız yapmanız gereken zaman, başvurmanız gereken zaman şimdi. Ee, bu vazifemi de yapmış oldum. Bugün şöyle yapacağız. Şimdi önce size anlatmam gereken biraz iktisat var. O işin bir kuyruğunu bağlamamız lazım. Ee, yani işte bir yarım saat kırk dakika bunu yapmak istiyorum. Ondan sonra da bu iki hafta öğrendiğimiz iktisat araç gereceğini kullanarak Türkçe. Biraz Türkiye ekonomisi üzerine bu araç gereceğinde ne sorular sorulabilir? Bunun e, hani işte bu kavramların Türkçesi nedir? Hani bu işte biraz da Türkçe yapıp size bu işi hem e, uygulaması nedir? Hem de e, bu kavramlar Türkçe ile kullanırken dil içinde nasıl geçiyor onu görün istiyorum. Ee, arkasından bunu yapmaya deneyeceğiz. Okay. So we talked about aggregate expenditure. In the simplest model we could think of, the model where there was no money, right? Then we said, well, we don't feel really we have to have money around all the time, but it's good to have prices. Right, because what is economics without prices? Right. So, so we said, let's introduce prices in the simplest possible setting, which is to say, we're going to have prices, but they're not going to do anything. Producers will be happy to pr produce unlimited quantities at any given price. Okay. Then we solve for the equilibrium of that economy. Then we said, well, that's not very realistic. Right. When you ask producers to produce more and more and more, eventually. They're going to want to charge higher prices, not just to produce more, right? So let's do that. And we did that. So what we ended up with was we have an aggregate demand curve that's still more sloping, right? And we have an aggregate supply curve that's upward sloping. Now. The really, really, really important thing here is to understand why this guy is downward sloping and this guy is upward sloping, right? This is not microeconomics. So the answer isn't, oh, relative prices are changing, it's more profitable to produce this. You know, this became relatively more expensive because we're talking about the price of everything, right? So we talked about the wealth effect for a great demand. We said, even though your income is real, your wealth is nominal. When prices increase, your real wealth falls, and that's why quantity demand that decreases, and we said for aggregate supply in a, this is an important term, in a frictionless economy, in an economy where there are no frictions of the kind, you know, wages don't adjust, prices don't adjust, information is asymmetric, right? When everybody knows everything, when all prices can change immediately, right? We're not going to have aggregate supply upward sloping. We're going to have it vertical. So we said, in the long run, aggregate supply will be vertical because in the long run, there are no frictions in this model, okay? So we're assuming in the short run, say, wages are sticky, and that's why aggregate supply is upward sloping. Wage stickiness is, remember, we have long-term wage contracts. I know what my wage will be for the next, well, at least six months, okay? If the price of the good that we're producing increases, right? My employer will want to produce more. Why? Because revenue is increasing, the price of the good you're selling is increasing, costs are not increasing as fast because my wage isn't increasing. Okay? Your real profits are increasing. Therefore, production became more, more profitable in the real sense. Okay? 
If production is more profitable, are you going to produce more? That was easy, okay? And that's why agri supply is upper sloping. But eventually, my wage is going to catch up. Eventually, I'm going to say, wait, the prices have increased. There's inflation, right? My nominal wage hasn't changed. What happened to my real wage? It decreased. If my real wage is decreased, you know, I'm not a very happy camper. Right? So I'm going to say, I want my real wage to go up to the level where it was. When my real wage catches up, this time what we have is the real profits are falling. Okay? That's why you're going to say, I'm going to go back to producing at the old level. That's here. Now, one important thing here that we haven't talked about on what we haven't talked about before is this long run agri supply is vertical and it's vertical at the potential. This is potential GDP here. It takes a little thinking to convince yourself why that would be the case. Now, do we agree that in the long run the economy will go to the long run agri supply? That we will be producing at this level? Good. Now the question becomes, once we get to a steady state, once the economy converges to a long run level, okay, can that level be anything other than the potential? This will have to come from the definition of the potential, right? We said the, the potential is normal, okay? Now, you know, we waited a long, long time, everything adjusted, prices adjusted, wages adjusted, right? We're in a long run equilibrium. Can we have cyclical unemployment? Really? If we have cyclical unemployment, will, we, will the wages stay the same? If we have cyclical unemployment, is the labor market in equilibrium? No. But if the labor market is not in equilibrium, can I be at the long range of supply? Ha, huh. so the labor market has to be in equilibrium. Can I have cyclical unemployment? Uh -huh, that was better, okay? Now you see why we have to be at the potential, right? The same thing applies for capital as well. If I'm not using my factories, okay, is the capital market in equilibrium? If I have all this idle capital, can I be in equilibrium? If I'm using my factories too much, can I be in equilibrium? If my factories have to work 24 hours a day, could this be an equilibrium? No. Right? It can be an equilibrium in the short run. You can do this for a while. But eventually, something will have to change. Prices will have to adjust. Okay? When the prices are no longer adjusting, when we're really at a long run equilibrium, can I be at any place, any production level, other than the potential? I, I really dislike this answer, but it is the correct answer uh, in spirit. Okay, so long run agri supply is vertical at potential GDP. This is something important for us because we define potential with efficient allocations. That is, in this model, potential GDP is where you would want to be if you were a planner, right? For those of you who have taken 101, if you had your benevolent social dictator, the guy who told everyone how much to produce, how much to consume, right? For the macroeconomy, that guy would choose the potential GDP. That's the normal, okay? That's the efficient. What we are saying here is, remember that your 101 told you that in a frictionless market economy, even if you don't have a planner, the price mechanism will bring you to an allocation such that you end up at the point that the planner would choose, right? So you really should be nodding to this one because I know that like, there are only two or three people in this class who have not taken 101. And if you learn only one thing from that class, well, maybe this, shouldn't, this doesn't have to be that one thing, but you know, this is in the top five, okay? This is your first welfare theorem that says, under the assumptions of this model in the long run where things are not sticky, 
you will end up at efficient equilibrium, right? If every market, every individual market is clearing at efficient levels, can we say the aggregate is also efficient? The sum of these is also efficient? That's why you have to be at the potential. Okay? In the short run, this is not correct. Because in the short run, we're saying there is at least one market where prices cannot adjust. If prices cannot adjust, will the equilibrium of that market be efficient? No. no. Right? So in our, in our example, this is the labor market. The labor market may be at inefficient levels, and therefore, in aggregate, you can be at inefficient levels in the short run, like here. OK? Good. So this is the promise of the you know, capitalism, free market economy, the price mechanism. right? You don't have to do anything as government, as planner. If you just wait long enough, you will end up at efficient levels. Okay? The question then becomes, are we happy waiting? Okay? Now, this is a purely taste question. You could say, you know, philosophically, I'm against government intervention, and therefore, I'd rather wait. Okay? I wouldn't. I'm for an activist government. But you don't get... At this level, you don't get guidance from economic theory. Right? What I would like you to see is the following. Study a bit more economics, you will get guidance from economic theory, whether there is a welfare improvement in government intervention or not. There are two things I'd like to, you to see. One is the following. So this is your potential. Okay? Let's say we start from a you know, dislikable equilibrium. Right? So we're here. Question. If we're here, what do we know about the labor market? It's not an equilibrium. Okay? Why? Because we're producing too little. If we're producing too little, can we be employing our labor efficiently? No. So do we have unemployment or overemployment? Very good. Right, so this is your labor market, this is your wage, right? So we're at a level like this. This is your unemployment. This is, this is where we're lifting things off on Monday, right? So we understand why this has to be the case, but we don't like it. Because it says, eh, in bad times, wages are high. We're not used to thinking that way, right? We, we, we're used to associating low wages with bad times, okay? This model says, well, however, if you're going to have bad times, the wage has to be too high, otherwise people will be employed. Okay? So, see? Duh. Duh. Good. So, this isn't very easy to think of, right? So we're going to get to better versions of this, right? Um, it's going to take a few weeks. But one of the problems here is we're not taking into account anything about expectations, expectations of inflation, right? The only thing we have here is the price level. We don't have inflation here, right? So when we f factor that in, things will become more sensible. Nonetheless, this feature that wages are counter-cyclical, okay? That is, think of the business cycle. It has the cyclical movement. So we categorize variables as pro-cyclical, that is, move with the cycle, and counter-cyclical, move against the cycle. Okay? So investment is pro-cyclical. When things go better, investment increases. Okay? Unemployment is counter-cyclical. When things go well, unemployment decreases. Okay? We'd like to think of wages as pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical. I'm asking, now I'm asking you not the model question. In the world, do you think wages are pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical? <coughs> They're pro-cyclical, right? I mean, in good times when the economy is growing fast, wages increase. Okay? Here what we have is wages are counter-cyclical in the model. Right? 
In bad times, wages are high. In good times, wages fall. Real wages. Real wages. Okay? You immediately see that this is consistent with the model, and this is economists care about a lot, right? Internal consistency of the model. However, I'm just pointing this out to you, right? You don't have to like this feature of this basic Keynesian model, and you probably shouldn't. Now, nonetheless, we can do our analysis, okay? This isn't totally incorrect. That is, although wages often don't behave this way, right? They can. The following is correct. Say you are in this psychic situation, right? You're stuck in a low output equilibrium, right? If we said we're decreasing the minimum wage, for example, right? Or we're just abolishing the minimum wage altogether and wages will fall, will producers hire more workers? Yes. If they hire more workers, are we going to have more output? Yes. So the model isn't saying something stupid, right? Although we don't observe this often, we could. This is a mechanism that would work. Okay? Now, this is your labor demand. This is your labor supply. Now, here's a question. If we're going to do two exercises. One is to say, we're going to wait this out. Okay? We already did this once. So we're going to just sit and say, eventually, markets will clear. Eventually, this wage will fall. Okay? And we're going to be at the potential. Right? What is the mechanism? What is going to happen? Is the goods market, is this market in equilibrium? No. Yes. See? Supply equals demand. Okay? It's not efficient. It's not a long run equilibrium, but this is an equilibrium. Okay? We just don't like this equilibrium. Right? But given the prices, given what they observe, okay, given everything else, are producers saying this is how much I want to produce and are the people who are doing the expenditure saying this is how much we want to buy and those quantities are equal. Is this correct? Yes. That's an equilibrium. Do you have an incentive to change your behavior? Not in this market. Okay? How about here? Is this market, is the labor market an equilibrium? This is the market that is not an equilibrium and this is where people have incentives to change their behavior. Why is that? Is this guy who wants to work a lot at this wage is she working a lot? No. Does she have an incentive to change her behavior? Does she have an incentive to change her pricing behavior? No. Pricing behavior meaning wage behavior in this, in this context. Do you, if you're unemployed, okay, do you have an incentive to change your price behavior? That is, do you have an incentive to ask for a lower wage? Yes. yes. Right? That's how the price mechanism brings a market to equilibrium. Okay? So what's going to happen? The wage will fall, and this market eventually will clear. Okay? This is what we mean by long run, right? Eventually, this market will also come to an equilibrium. But now something has changed. Wages are lower. Right? If wages are lower, does anything change here? Yes. What happens? Aircraft supply shifts. Okay? Why is that? Because your production is now cheaper, right? At every price level, are you making more or less real profits? You have more real profits, right? This is not a difficult story, okay? But you have to wrap your mind around this once. Okay? Once it makes sense to you, it makes sense to you forever. Wages are lower, the producers are saying, the price of the good I'm selling hasn't changed. My costs are falling. Do you want to produce more? Yes. Are you going to change your price? So you're saying, I don't want to change my price. I want to stay at this price. But everybody is doing the same thing, right? So aggregate supply increases. Now, you want to be at this price. But do people want to buy this much at that price? No. 
you have to eventually decrease the price. This is the equilibrium point. Okay? Is this working out? Very good. So we did find, so we started out with a recessionary gap and came to the efficient equilibrium and we didn't, so now we are the policy makers, we didn't touch the economy, right? It worked on its own. Cool. The question here is, how long did this take and are we happy waiting this out? In particular, one of the things that we suspect is these wages are extremely, so we talked about wage stickiness already, wages don't change quickly, right? We suspect that wages are sticky in an asymmetric way. That is, it's easier to change wages up. I'm not going to object if you increase my wage, okay? But harder to decrease them, all right? If you come to me and say, I want you to work the same hours, but say at a lower wage, or you want to tell them, I want you to work each hour at a lower wage, right? Most likely I'm going to say over my dead body, okay? The problem here is this. If you're hiring someone new, perhaps you can hire that guy at a lower wage than your existing workers. But this requires the wages of all workers to decrease. The people who are already working are now working at a lower wage. Does that happen often? It actually happens more often than you would think because this is a real wage. Okay? If you don't increase my wages, what is the inflation rate in Turkey now? The annual inflation, the yearly inflation. It just exceeded 10% because it was announced this morning. Inflation rate. I'm telling you, right? I mean, just <laughs> this morning, the February inflation number was announced, and we're back to double, double digits. Okay? We have crossed the 10% threshold. And you really should read the central bank's write up about what happened to inflation tomorrow. It's going to be out tomorrow, right? Because these guys were saying for months that at the beginning of the year, inflation will pick up. At the beginning of the year, inflation will pick up. But you, know, you shouldn't be alarmed. We know this is going to happen, and this is going to be temporary. Why is that? So you should read that, because you, know, you are the enlightened people of this country, and you should be aware of these things, right? And then maybe we can talk about that sometime next week. Now, but the point is this. If my wage, nominal wage, hasn't changed for a year, right? which it really didn't change much. Okay? What happened to my real wage? It really did decrease, right? Because the price level is up 10%. My nominal wage didn't change. My purchasing power, right? the real value of my wage, has decreased. Am I a happy employee? Yeah, you bet. And that's not only because the university's name has changed. Okay? I am just pissed off blanket. Now, is my employer happy? My, is my employer happy? If my real wage is lower, okay, then he must be making more profits. Are the goods of are, are the prices of the goods the employer is selling higher? Yes. How do you know this? Yeah. Otherwise, we couldn't have inflation. Since there's inflation, the goods that we're producing are more expensive. My wage hasn't changed. My real wage is lower, right? My employer is happier. Well, this is exactly what, what would go on, okay? If you just created inflation. We don't have inflation in this world, okay? But we're going to get to that. If, if I, rather than saying I'm going to wait this out, if I just created inflation, that would be the same thing, okay? Now. Now let's think of, well, what would happen? But, but you understand why it could take a very, very, very long time for this world to come to an equilibrium. If my wage isn't falling, okay, will I see this agri supply shift? No. That's it. So you may be stuck at this level for a long, long time. Okay? 
Now let's think of the following. Let's say, nah, I'm going to do this on the same, same graph. Let's say we started out at exactly the same point. Okay? So we're here again. This time, we're going to say, I want to do this with policy. Okay? Government says, let's say, I'm not going to spend government spend, I'm, not, I'm not going to increase government spending, but I'm going to increase government investment. We consider this as investment. Okay? And this is one of the more important well, it's one of the actually less important things, but you, you should keep this in mind. Not all expenditures of the government are in G. Okay? When the government builds a factory, builds roads, does investment, it's investment. Okay? Government spending is government consumption. Right? The government buying potatoes to eat them, not to do investment with them. Okay? Now, the government says, I'm going to increase investment. Okay? What happens here? What happens to agri-supply? So we're going to have this conversation a zillion times this semester. Okay? Aggregate demand. What are the components of aggregate demand? What is in this? Yes, consumption. Uh, somebody said investment. Remember what investment is. Investment isn't a factory appearing out of nothing and suddenly spitting, spitting out more goods. Okay? That would be your supply increase. That's not investment. I mean, you know, you may have heard of people actually doing investment. Okay? And you know that these guys have to plan ahead because you begin to build a factory today, it's operational three years down the road, and you have to forecast you know, what the environment will be like in three years' time. Okay? So let me ask again. When you do investment, are you immediately producing new goods and services, or are you using existing goods and services for investment purposes? Aha. Uh -huh. So are you demanding stuff? Or are you supplying stuff for investment? Mm -hmm. All right? Investment is part of aggregate demand, not supply. If you do proper investment, eventually you will have more capital, perhaps better capital, then your potential GDP will increase. Long run aggregate supply will shift. Okay? We're not going to worry about that now. Okay? We're just thinking of. Now, suddenly, investment increased. What happens? This is investment demand, okay? Aggregate demand increases, all right? So in this sense, increasing investment behaves very much like increasing government spending, right? But we don't think of these things as perfect substitutes, although they do the same thing to aggregate demand, because investment turns into something productive down the road. It increases your long-run aggregate supply. But government spending is government spending. I eat it, or the government eats it. It's just gone. Now, we could do this with investment. We could do this with government spending. Let's say we're doing this with government spending. What kind of government spending could you do? You find yourself in a low output equilibrium, and you're saying, I'm the government. I'm going to increase my spending. Would this help? Would anything change here if government spending increased? Yeah. What? Aggregate demand would increase. Right? Government spending is part of demand, so you would increase demand. Good. Always remember this. All government policy, okay? government spending, investment subsidies, monetary policy, they are all demand management tools. Okay? We have very little control on aggregate supply. If we could control aggregate supply, our lives would be so, e so easy. So easy, right? Because just Jack this up. Prices are lower, quantities are higher, life doesn't get better than that. Okay? Our only problem is that we can't do this. We can only play with aggregate demand. And you can immediately see what happens, right? We could increase quantities, but what would happen to prices? Prices would also increase. Do we want to increase prices? So now we understand why we don't just jack up aggregate demand all the way up all the time. Okay? But there are other reasons. Say we're doing this with government spending. So, and 
say somebody is the prime minister. Who wants to be the prime minister today? You don't have to be our current prime minister. You could be a decent prime minister. Right. So let's have this lady as the prime ministers. What would you spend on? Potatoes. Potatoes. Ah, you're my kind of prime minister. <laughs> Pick some, no, I'm, I'm actually asking a serious policy question now, okay? You're the prime minister of Turkey today. Is our country at potential? Are we in our longer equilibrium? Yes. Really? So she says 14% unemployment is perfectly normal and acceptable for our country. And she will not be reelected, let alone pass this class. Let's try this again. Do you think we're producing at our potential now? Do you think Turkey is utilizing her factors of production efficiently? Normally? Yes. Yes, normally, she insists. Let's think of our labor force, right? Do you think that our labor force is normally utilized now, normally used? Do you think that the number of people who are actually working out of the labor force are the normal number of people who would work? No. no. She's mumbling, but I can hear what she's saying, so I'm just repeating for you to hear. No, okay? There's an echo here. So the first thing for us is to say, Although you would make a great prime minister now, right? Because she's saying it's just all fine, right? Tay it. Right. This is the way things are supposed to be, right? Well, let's agree that this is not a good equilibrium that we have now, okay? But we're, we're really talking about, you know, the 2010 March 3rd Turkey, okay? Too many people are unemployed, we're producing too little, therefore we're consuming too little, right? Okay, what would you do? We tell you that we as the people want you to do government spending. Increase your spending. What would you do? What would you buy? What would you give to people? So she said potatoes, and that's an answer, right? You could say, I'm going to just buy potatoes and give it to the unemployed people. Could you do this? Yes. yes. Would, you be, would, would this be something good? Yes. I would think so. Okay. What else would you do? Would you, for example, buy washing machines and give it to people who don't have running water in Tunjiri? <laughs> The key answer here is, of course you could do this. Are you increasing government spending? Yes. yes. Will there be more production of washing machines? Yes. Will this have a multiplier effect? Will the people who produce washing machines be receiving a higher income? Yes. Will they consume more? Yes. Ah, see? This is actually working out. However, the question here is this. If you did the same expenditure on something better, rather than buying the washing machines and giving it to the guy who doesn't have running water, if you just gave the unemployed people potatoes, would you have the same multiplier effect? Why not? Will, will there be more production of potatoes? I mean, if you're buying washing machines, and this is leading to more production of washing machines, if you buy potatoes, would this not lead to more production of potatoes? Yes. yes. Will the potato producer receive more income? Yes. Will they consume more? Will there be a multiplier mechanism here as well? Sure. So the point here is, as long as you're increasing government spending, you are going to have the multiplier effect. But you could do this in a smart way that would be increasing welfare, right? Or you could do this the dumb way, right? You could just say, ah, increasing spending, right? Can you try to build a bridge to, say, Cyprus and stop it midway? Decide that it can't be done. Yes, you can, but you would build the bridge, bridge part of the way, okay? So, can you build a health bridge to Cyprus from Turkey? Yes, I mean, this is, this is doable, okay? Would you be buying steel and asphalt and you name it, whatever, and would you be employing people to do the production and would you be creating income? Yes. yes. Would this have a multiplier effect? Would we, would we be happy because we have a health bridge to Cyprus? Okay, so what we understand here is, and what the Prime Minister now also understands, you do understand this, right? Very good. Is that government spending, be it smart government spending or dumb government spending, helps expand the economy, okay? If you do this smartly, 
you do it better. Like what? If you make sure that the income is accrued more by poorer people, they spend more. Okay? Could she, for example, say, I'm not just gonna I'm not gonna buy anything. I'm just gonna give people money. Okay? Or give give people purchasing power. Could she do this? Right? Would you rather give it to I don't know, Rahmi Koch or some unemployed guy? For two reasons. One, you have some social justice in mind. Two, even if you don't have any social justice in mind, Rahmi Koch will not even recognize that he has an, you know, another 100 lira somewhere. Okay? The poor guy will spend it. Which one will create a larger multiplier mechanism? Okay? So that's important. Okay? Then we solve for the equilibrium of that economy. Then we said, well, that's not very realistic, right? When you ask producers to produce more and more and more, eventually they're going to want to charge higher prices, not just to produce more. Right? So let's do that. And we did that. So what we ended up with was we have an aggregate demand curve. They're still more sloping. Right? And we have an aggregate supply curve. There's upward sloping. Now, the really, really, really important thing here is to understand why this guy is downward sloping and this guy is upward sloping, right? This is not microeconomics. So the answer isn't, oh, relative prices are changing. It's more profitable to produce this. You know, this became relatively more expensive because we're talking about the price of everything, right? So we talked about the wealth effect for a great demand. We said, even though your income is real, your wealth is nominal. When prices increase, your real wealth falls. And that's why quantity demand decreases. And we said for aggregate supply, in a, this is an important term, in a frictionless economy, in an economy where şimdi önce size anlatmam gereken biraz iktisat var. O işin kuyruğunu bağlamamız lazım. Yani işte bir yarım saat kırk dakika bunu yapmak istiyorum. Ondan sonra da bu iki hafta öğrendiğimiz iktisat araç gelecini kullanarak Türkçe, biraz Türkiye ekonomisi üzerine bu araç gelecinin ne sorular sorulabilir? Bunun Hani işte bu kavramların Türkçesi nedir? Hani bu işte biraz da Türkçe yapıp size bu işi hem e, uygulaması nedir hem de e, bu kavramlar Türkçe'de kullanırken dil içinde nasıl geçiyor onu görün istiyorum. E, Arkasından bunu yapmayı deneyeceğiz. Okay. So we talked about aggregate expenditure. In the simplest model we could think of, the model where there was no money. Right? Then we said, well, we don't really have to have money around all the time, but it's good to have prices, right? Because what is economics without prices? Right? So, so we said, let's introduce prices in the simplest possible setting, which is to say, we're going to have prices, but they're not going to do anything. Producers will be happy to pr produce unlimited quantities at any given price. There are no frictions of the kind, you know, wages don't adjust, prices don't adjust, information is asymmetric, right? When everybody knows everything, when all prices can change immediately, right? We're not going to have aggregate supply upward sloping. We're going to have it vertical. So we said, in the long run, aggregate supply will be vertical. Because in the long run, there are no frictions in this model, okay? So we're assuming in the short run, say, wages are sticky, and that's why aggregate supply is upward sloping. Wage stickiness is, remember, we have long-term wage contracts. I know what my wage will be for the next, well, at least six months, okay? If the price of the good that we're producing increases, right, my employer will want to produce more. Why? Because Revenue is increasing, the price of the good you're selling is increasing. Costs are not increasing as fast because my wage isn't increasing. Okay? Your real profits are increasing. Therefore, production became more, profi more profitable in the real sense. Okay? If production is more profitable, are you going to produce more? That was easy. Okay? And that's why agri supply is upward sloping. But eventually, my wage is going to catch up. Eventually, I'm going to say, wait, the prices have increased. There's inflation, right? 
my nominal wage hasn't changed, what happened to my real wage? It decreased. If my real wage is decreased, you know, I'm not a very happy camper. Right? So I'm going to say I want my real wage to go up to the level where it was. When my real wage catches up, this time what we have is the real profits are falling. Okay? That's why you're going to say I'm going to go back to producing at the old level. That's here. Now, one important thing here that we haven't talked about on what well, we haven't talked about before is this long run aggregate supply is vertical and it's vertical at the potential. This is potential GDP here. It takes a little thinking to convince yourself why that would be the case. Now, do we agree that in the long run the economy will go to the long run aggregate supply? That we Günaydın. Ee, başlamadan önce bir duyuru yapayım size. Biliyorsunuz üniversitemizin bir işletme ve ekonomi topluluğu var. Bu bir öğrenci topluluğu. İşletme ve ekonomi topluluğunun yılda bir defa bir işte işletme ve ekonomi topluluğu iş seminerleri oluyor. Ee, bu topluluktaki arkadaşlarımız benden size bunu duyurmamı rica ettiler. Bunu hatırlatmalar ne zaman tarihleri? 12 Mart'ta 14 Mart'ta kadar İstanbul'da yapacaklarmış bu işlerini. Haberli olunuz, ilgileniyorsanız gidiniz. Bunu yapacaksanız yapmanız gereken zaman, başvurmanız gereken zaman şimdi. Ee, bu vazifemi de yapmış oldum. Bugün şöyle yapacağız.